Macmillan Audio presents Killing England by Bill O'Reilly and Martin Dugard. Read for you by Bill O'Reilly and Robert Petkoff. Bill O'Reilly here. This book is dedicated to all American history teachers, past and present. Prologue. Ohio Country, North America, July 9, 1755, 1.30 p.m. The long knives are out. The face of Captain Daniel Hysenthe Marie Lenard de Bougeot is striped in war paint. Primeval Forest conceals his French Marines, Canadian militia, and Indian allies as they maneuver into position. Hidden behind boulders and ancient oak trees, they await the massive combined force of the British and colonial armies now marching toward them. Bougeot's French and Indians are heavily outnumbered. Unlike the British, they don't have cannon that can kill and maim dozens with a single blast of canister shot. Instead, their weapons are those of a nimble guerrilla fighting force, muskets, tomahawks, war clubs to bash skulls, and sharp knives for slicing the flesh and hair from a dying man's head. Captain Bougeot clearly sees the dirty crimson uniforms and miter caps of the 44th and 48th Regiment's grenadier companies. These foot soldiers at the front of the British ranks are an elite fighting force. As best the French commander can tell, they number about 300 men. He has scouted the enemy well and knows that hundreds more British and Americans follow behind them in a thin mile-long column hemmed in on both sides by the woods. Bougeot is stripped to the waist in the manner of his Indian allies. Bear grease smeared on his torso will make him slippery and more difficult to fight when the combat becomes hand-to-hand. The 43-year-old father of nine never tires of defeating the British. Killing them, he has written in his journal, fills him with joy. His weapon of choice is a musket made at the Toulé Arsenal in Saint-Étienne, France. The Indians under his command, warriors from many tribes, are so enamored of this lightweight weapon that they ask for the Toulé Fusil by name. But right now, those guns are silent. The French and Indians hold their fire as they await the moment when Bougeot will stand tall in a forest to wave his hat. That's the signal to attack. Oblivious to the coming ambush, 23-year-old George Washington sits gingerly in the saddle at the very rear of the British column, guiding his horse along the narrow path leading straight into the hidden enemy. Dressed in the blue uniform of the Virginia militia, Washington is in agony. A tall and charismatic young man with large hands and a face marked by smallpox scars, Washington rides atop a pillow to protect his ailing backside from the pain of hemorrhoids. A rumble in his belly signals yet another attack of dysentery, forcing him to abruptly guide his charger into the forest in search of discreet relief. The young Virginian contents himself with the knowledge that the march is almost over. After six weeks and 290 back-breaking miles through the wilderness, the British Army is just one day away from reaching the French garrison known as Fort Duquesne, which it plans to destroy. Washington's intestinal illness forced him to travel flat on his back in a covered wagon until yesterday, but it is vital that he ride into battle on horseback. Just one year ago, he was the officer who fired the first shot in the war between the British and the French. The volley fired by a young Virginian in the backwoods of America set the world on fire, is how one British historian will describe the incident. Indeed, Washington's decision to attack a small French scouting party, killing all of its soldiers, will launch what will become known as history's First World War. In time, the fighting will spread far beyond North America into Europe, Africa, and even India. But that moment of impulse eventually led to public disgrace. Soon after the skirmish, Washington suffered the humiliation of surrendering his Virginia militia to the French at a battlefield not far from here, known as Fort Necessity. In order to avoid a wider war, the French allowed Washington and his men to return home, but the stigma of failure still hangs over the ambitious former surveyor. He has returned to this forest as a volunteer, seeking redemption 
by using his knowledge of the lush woodland trails to assist the British commander, General Edward Braddock. Unbeknownst to George Washington, however, the battle he seeks will not take place tomorrow. It's happening right now. 